Welcome back fellow mitochondriacs for another episode of Cancer is a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Today we're going to be talking about the enzyme known as catalase as our next enzyme system that is responsible for protecting cancer cells and how cancer cells use catalase to their advantage to survive the increased ROS environment of a normal cancer cell, but also how to survive certain chemo or radiotherapy modalities. We're going to look at how the concentration differs in normal cells compared to cancer cells. And lastly, we're going to look at, are there any ways to inhibit this important enzyme? So without further ado, let's get into it. The first paper I'm going to look at was published in 2019, and it's titled The Role of Catalase in Oxidative Stress and Age-Associated Degenerative Diseases. And it says here that a catalase is one of the crucial antioxidant enzymes that mitigates oxidative stress to a considerable extent by destroying cellular hydrogen peroxide to produce water and oxygen. Deficiency or malfunction of catalase is postulated to be related to the pathogenesis of many age-associated degenerative diseases like diabetes, hypertension, anemia, vitiligo, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, bipolar, cancer, and schizophrenia. And the graphic that was part of this paper tells the story. So we have hydrogen peroxide, which is considered a free radical, and it can be effectively gotten rid of by a couple different enzyme systems, one of which is the glutathione system, which we've talked about, and the other is the catalase enzyme, which we're talking about in this particular video. And then if hydrogen peroxide is not gotten rid of, then that's where it can participate in the Fenton reaction and lead to more dangerous free radicals, such as the hydroxyl radical. It says here, reactive species are highly active moieties, some of which are direct oxidants, and some have oxygen or oxygen-like electronegative elements produced within the cell during cellular metabolism or under pathologic conditions. Some of the reactive species are free radicals, such as the hydroxyl radical and the superoxide radical, and some are non-radicals, such as hydrogen peroxide. Free radicals are any independent species which consist of one or more unpaired electrons in their atomic or molecular orbital. They are generally unstable, short-lived, but usually chemically reactive. They can react with any molecule either by oxidizing it or by causing any other kind of chemical modification. Free radicals can potentially oxidize other cellular biomolecules, including nucleic acids, DNA, RNA, proteins, and lipids. For example, peroxidation of omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid, such as arachidonic acid or linoleic acid, leads to production of 4 hydroxy nonanol HNE, which is one of the main reactive aldehydes produced by oxidative stress. There are many reactive species and free radicals which are listed in table 1. These free radicals are formed in the cell during normal cellular metabolism as mitochondrial electron transport chain, beta oxidation of fatty acids, and cytochrome P450 mediated reactions, and the respiratory burst during immune defense. For example, auto-oxidation of some biologically important substances such as FADH2 and tetrahydropteridines can yield O2 negative in the presence of oxygen. The imbalance between production and quenching of these radical substances through antioxidant mechanisms causes oxidative stress. The loss of functionality or adaptability of important biomolecules due to oxidative stress are two interdependent biologic processes, which are among the important factors that mediate aging. The free radical hypothesis, also known as the oxidative stress hypothesis, is one of the strongly supported theories which can define the cause behind the aging process. And in table one, it gives us kind of an exhaustive list of radical species that are produced within the body. And some of this we've talked about in the past, like superoxide or hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radicals, but there's a whole host of other like lipid radicals, which take place within the peroxidation process or hypochlorite or nitrile chloride or nitric oxide, peroxine nitrate, etc. These are all nitrogen radicals. And then there's even some sulfur radicals, these thiol radicals that can be produced as well. So a catalase is one of the most important antioxidant enzymes. It is present in almost all aerobic organisms. Catalase breaks down two hydrogen peroxide molecules into one molecule of oxygen and two molecules of water in a two-step reaction. Humans possess a typical monofunctional heme-containing catalase having a prosthetic group of ferric protoporphyrin-9, which reacts with hydrogen peroxide. 
Located in the peroxisomes, the enzyme has a molecular mass of approximately 220, 240 kilodaltons. Catalase-related diseases. Catalase deficiency or malfunctioning is associated with many diseases such as diabetes mellitus, vitiligo, cardiovascular diseases, Wilson's disease, hypertension, anemia, some dermatological disorders, Alzheimer's disease, bipolar, and schizophrenia. It has been reported that an anomaly of catalase activity is inherited in a catalasemia, which is a rare genetic disorder, also known as Takahara disease. It is an autosomal recessive trait and characterized by a reduced level of catalase. Catalase has a prime role in regulating the cellular level of hydrogen peroxide, and its hydrogen peroxide catabolism, or breakdown, protects the cells from oxidative assault. For example, by securing the pancreatic beta cells, by securing the pancreatic beta cells from hydrogen peroxide injury, low catalase activities has been reported in schizophrenic patients, such as also in patients with atherosclerosis. And you'll see here by this graphic that if you have a catalase efficiency, it's associated with several disorders of the neurologic systems, metabolic systems, as well as cancer, which we'll talk about. So the next article I'm pulling is very recent, published October 24th of 2025, and it's titled Catalase, the Golden Key to Regulate Oxidative Stress in Breast Cancer. And it says catalase is a kind of tetrameric protein in the human body, it plays as a key regulator for controlling oxidative stress. The main function of catalase is to regulate the concentration of hydrogen peroxide by catalyzing the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. At present, it is reported that catalase is also involved in regulating the oxidative stress in tumor cells, and its expression level is significantly related to the development of breast cancer. In addition, catalase and other different expression patterns was related in the proliferation, invasion, treatment, and prognosis of breast cancer cells. Meanwhile, breast cancer is a common and well-known cancer among women worldwide, and its incidence has been increasing in recent years. Therefore, in-depth study of catalase and the pathogenesis and progression of breast cancer is of great significance for the future treatments and diagnosis. The present review summarized the effect of oxidative stress on cancer cells and emphasized the key role of catalase in the development of breast cancer, which provides a key clue for promoting research on breast cancer and selecting therapeutic targets. And we see here in this graphic that there is a kind of double-edged sword, like with most antioxidant systems we've talked about in the past. Chronic exposure to oxidative stress can lead to disease, but once disease is actually formed in the form of cancer in this particular case, that leads to upregulations in catalase activity. And sometimes the way that we try to attack cancer cells through either chemotherapy, radiation therapy, etc., is to try to increase reactive oxygen species. So in this case, we're talking about doxorubicin, increasing hydrogen peroxide. And when catalase is upregulated, it will lead to the blockade of the hydrogen peroxide or radical-related damage in these particular breast cancer cells. And then in addition to that, it leads to a protective effect. So one of the things that we know that can happen when you starve cancer cells of glucose is it increases the reactive oxygen species and the oxidative stress within cancer cells, but catalase can help overcome that stress by buffering the reactive oxygen species. And catalase, by blocking hydrogen peroxide or detoxifying hydrogen peroxide, can then lead to less apoptosis or programmed cell death. So it's not unique to catalase, per se, that these antioxidant systems protect cancer, but these are just the unique ways that catalase does protect cancer by specifically working on the hydrogen peroxide that's made within cancer cells. So this paper was published in December of 2016, and it's titled, Tumor Cells Have Decreased Ability to Metabolize Hydrogen Peroxide, Implications for Pharmacologic Ascorbate in Cancer Therapy. So it's been found that there is a differential concentration of catalase within cancer and normal cells. And it says here, a differential in the capacity of cancer cells to remove hydrogen peroxide was revealed, and the average K cell for normal cells being twice that of a tumor cell. It says here, while hydrogen peroxide is a strong oxidant, it is not very reactive because of a slow reaction kinetics with the majority of biomolecules. Thus, it can accumulate to relatively high concentrations in cells and tissues. There, it can be activated to produce more reactive oxygen such as compound I of heme peroxidases and hydroxyl free radicals. The removal of excess hydrogen peroxide by antioxidant enzymes is therefore central in minimizing cellular damage. The principal enzyme responsible for elimination of hydrogen peroxide is catalase, glutathione peroxidase, and the pyroredoxins, PRX. 
Connect models built using in vitro data have demonstrated that catalase is the major enzyme involved in the detoxification of high concentration of hydrogen peroxide, such as those as a result from the oxidation of P-ascorbic acid in the culture medium where glutathione peroxidase and P-reductins are responsible for removing low fluxes of hydrogen peroxide. Catalase is largely localized in the peroxisomes of nucleated mammalian cells where it is catalyzes the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. It later says, studies have shown that all but one human cancer cell type, human renal adenocarcinoma, have low levels of both catalase and glutathione peroxidase. This suggests that the vast majority of cancer cells may lack the biochemical machinery needed to detoxify higher fluxes of hydrogen peroxide efficiently. And here it says the on average normal cells have a higher rate constants for removing extracellular hydrogen peroxide in comparison to cancer cells 5.5 versus 3.1, 10 to the negative 12th seconds to the negative one compared to cancer cells by about two. We see here that here is the normal cells ability to get rid of hydrogen peroxide versus the tumor cells ability to get rid of the hydrogen peroxide. And we can see here that this is the ability for each tumor type to get rid of hydrogen peroxide. And we see here that the average for a normal cell is about 5.5. And some of these cancer cells have much lower, like breast cancer, head and neck cancers, melanoma, and some types of pancreatic cancers have very low ability to get rid of hydrogen peroxide, even much lower than the average of cancer cells. Discussion. The data presented here quantitatively established the central role for hydrogen peroxide generated upon oxidation of ascorbic acid in the cytotoxic effects of ascorbic acid in cancer cells in vitro. Our data quantitatively support the many observations that indicate that cytotoxicity of ascorbic acid to cancer cells observed in vitro is largely due to this generation of hydrogen peroxide in the medium. Ascorbate delivered at pharmacological concentrations has shown selective toxicity to several different tumor cell types. While this selective cytotoxicity has been observed to be dependent on the generation of hydrogen peroxide, the mechanism by which this occurs is still undergoing investigation. There is a wide range of abilities that different tissue types remove hydrogen peroxide. We quantitatively determined that such capacities for 10 different normal tissue cell types and 15 different cancer cell lines. On average, the normal cells measured removed hydrogen peroxide at a rate constant that was twofold higher than the cancer cell lines tested. We observed a large range in these rate constants for removal of hydrogen peroxide, both across different tissue types within the different cell lines of the same tissue origin. Decreasing catalase activity increased sensitivity to ascorbic acid. This suggests that catalase may serve as a therapeutic target. A pharmacological inhibitor of catalase activity in tumor cells may be an effective combination therapy to increase the efficacy of ascorbic acid. In these studies, we used 3-AT to inhibit catalase, while 3-AT is not currently utilized in the clinic or in vivo because of its non-specific to tumor cells. There are other natural products that are potentially catalase inhibitors being investigated. This includes salicylic acid, anthocyanidins, methyl dopa, and neutralizing antibodies. These advances in targeting these types of reagents may lead to increased efficacy of redox-based therapies and improve patient survival. So that led me to ask the question, besides what was listed in that paper, what other things could potentially be at our disposal to inhibit catalase to maximize metabolic therapies and oxidative stressors? So it came across this paper that was published in November of 2017 and is titled Catalase Inhibition, an Anti-Cancer Property of Flavonoids, a Kinetic and Structural Evaluation. And it says here, flavonoids are dietary polyphenols that present abundantly in fruits and vegetables. Flavonoids have an inhibitory effects on enzymes and catalase is one among them. Catalase is a common enzyme ubiquitously found in all living organisms exposed to oxygen. It catalyzes the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. Inhibition of pure and cellular catalase from K562 cells by flavonoid was similar and exhibited the following efficacy. Myrocetin, quercetin, camphorol, quercetin, greater than luteolin, greater than apigenin, demonstrating structural activity relationship. I thought this article was interesting because not only did it say that in general, most flavonoids have effects on catalase, the basic structure of all flavonoids having an inhibitory effect on catalase, but then it actually ranks like what flavonoids are the most effective at inhibiting catalase, some of which we've seen before in the past, some of our favorites like quercetin, apigenin, et cetera. Then I found this article that was even slightly older, published in July of 2014, and it's titled 
inhibition of catalase by T catechins in free and cellular state, a biophysical approach. And it says here in the abstract, EGCG exhibited maximum inhibition of pure catalase. It also inhibited cellular catalase in K562 cancer cells and with significant increases in cellular reactive oxygen species, ROS, and suppression of cell viability. These results decipher the molecular mechanism by which T catechins interact with catalase and highlight the potential gallated catechin like EGCG as an anti-cancer drug. EGCG may have other non-specific targets in the cell, but its anti-cancer property is mainly defined by ROS accumulation due to catalase inhibition. I'll agree to disagree with the article. There's a ton of other things that EGCG does that can contribute to the accumulation of ROS apart from catalase inhibition, but I do think this is a very important one. So I guess the answer is drink your green tea and take your quercetin and apigenin, et cetera, and flavonoids for the inhibition of catalase, which is going to ultimately maximize the efficacy of oxidative stressors, such as the hydrogen peroxide created from things like ascorbic acid. If you like videos like this, please like, share, and subscribe. And until next time.